This is Peter. And this is Tom. And you're listening to History Teachers Talking Podcast. Now part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. All right, this is Peter Zablocki and Thomas Reska, and welcome back to our podcast. Tommy, what do we got today? Well, today we're going to take a look back at some of the uh, major sporting events, not just in American history, but in all of history. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit in detail about more than others, something we we're just going to kind of just mention. Um, this is not like a top whatever list. We're not saying this this one moment was the bigger than the others. We're just going to go over some, sometimes it'll be in chronological or sometimes it won't. We're going to skip over different sports, just ones that kind of had a lasting impact, whether in the sports world, but also those that kind of crossed over into the mainstream also and um, changed, let's say, culture or changed the country or the world in some way. So just kind of these big moments in sports, given the fact that, you know, the summer's coming up now and everyone's outside playing sports. So let's look at some major moments in the world of sports. Yeah, I don't know about playing sports. I'm like, I'm cool watching a baseball game, eating a hot dog, but I don't know about playing right now. That's not, really, that's, not, that's not really your but, thing anymore? No, dude, walking hurts me. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> getting old. Uh, so like, as you mentioned, Tom, I don't, you know, I don't think we're going to be getting in too much depth in a lot of these things. However, we are going to highlight some more than others. And and a lot of these, when I was doing this research, I realized we've actually covered, we've, we've covered them in our different historical topics throughout the past three years of us doing this podcast. Uh, because as you mentioned, a lot of these become historically significant events, which is why we're doing this podcast. I don't think this has any chronological order whatsoever. But yeah, so I, I guess we're, we're ready to go. Uh, do you want to get us started with a historically significant sporting event? Well, sure. The one I'll start with is ones I think we did talk about before. There's been a lot on it, but because um, it's always fun, it was to talk about and go over definitely changed the world and things of that nature was the 1936 uh, Berlin Olympics, right? Absolutely. So we've definitely we've talked about that one before people are aware of it. But basically the 36 Olympics were supposed to be the Nazi showcase, right? It was Hitler just came to power just a few years before, about three years before. It was the first game to be televised, the first radio broadcast in 41 different countries. And the whole idea was it was supposed to promote the idea of Aryan supremacy. Right, um, Hitler orders the construction of a massive stadium. He has that 1935 propaganda film, The Triumph of Wills, to document the games. Jewish athletes were banned from competing the German team, and the German team overall did perform very well. But the big breakout, the person who became most famous from this, was obviously the American track and field athlete Jesse Owens. Right, he wins four gold medals yeah. and was the uh, most successful at the games. So I think he breaks, he breaks like records. Yeah, at the time, yeah, yeah he breaks them all. Yep. And um, it was supposed to show white supremacy, Aryan supremacy. And really, it was an African-American athlete that stole the show. And this is before, like, America was really, like, a big, like, um, power. Forget yeah. about world power, but also, like, athletic power, too. Like, winning gold medals in the Olympics was a big deal. But it wasn't something that, like, you know, America always wanted to be, like, the one that win all the gold medals. That wasn't what it was in the 1930s. Since we're kind of staying with the race uh, aspect of it, Jackie Robinson's break into color barrier in 1947. He was basically the first African-American to play the Major League Baseball game, an accomplishment that was not really achieved prior to this. And we discussed this a lot further when we did our baseball podcast. You guys want to go back and listen to it. On April 15, 1947, he became the first African-American player in Major League Baseball. He was starting at first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He you know, comes out for the Dodgers, right? He winds up uh, playing in six World Series, wins one of them in 1955, and ba basically breaks that color barrier, like like we said before. And it ushers, you can imagine what baseball would be today if it didn't have African-American players in it. If you ever seen the movie, read a documentary, didn't mean at all that it was easy for him. I know we've we no, kind no. of talked about it too, but he was playing in the South. So you had the Jim Crow law still, had massive segregation and stuff. That just his bravery and perseverance for all the years of uh, racial abuse he had, you know, he becomes more than just a baseball player, he becomes a civil rights icon and really one of the most influential baseball players of all time. So much for that, his number is actually retired in all of baseball from number 42. No one wears that in baseball except on Jackie Robertson Day, which is the anniversary of when he broke the color barrier in early um, every year where every player will wear 42 on that day. So that just shows you his impact on the sport. That's awesome. Isn't it? I feel like that's awesome. Yeah, well, it's, it's a uh, rightful tribute, without a doubt. And kind of going back also a little bit, the one that kind of pops up as well oftentimes is the World War One Christmas ceasefire um, soccer game, which we also covered, actually, as a podcast. Yeah, well, it's not really, I mean, I, I, it was a sporting event. It was like an unsanctioned sporting event, but it showed how yeah. like, sports can transcend even, you know, whatever's going on during the war, war at the time. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. And the again, World War. Yeah. In December 1914, uh, just before Christmas, on Christmas Eve, you had this unofficial ceasefire. But it kind of shows, as you mentioned, it showed how sports can bring nations together, uh, even in times of war. And this pops up a lot, actually, during uh, my search for sporting events and how often sports bring people brings people together. In this case, what you had is... You had the British, French, and the German soldiers that you know, they were standing in opposite trenches. On Christmas Eve, they wind up leaving the trenches, collecting their wounded and dead from no man's land. But they also start exchanging different gifts and greetings, and they play unsanctioned football in, or soccer game on Christmas Eve. From that point forward, it's kind of known as the Christmas truce of World War One, and again, shows how sports bring nations together. I mean, talk about sports bringing nations together. I guess we could go to ping pong diplomacy in 1970s. So that was a big deal. Bit different than what Forrest Gump showed. A little bit different. Yes, although that would be cool. After World War II, the Chinese and the U.S. relations kind of grew cold, mainly because China. Good, yeah. yeah, mainly because China's economy was was turning towards Soviet Union. And sure enough, by 1950, uh, China falls, um, or rather becomes communism. It doesn't fall. It becomes communist. And their relations got even even worse, specifically after the Korean War started, because we more or less fought. China once they entered the Korean War. So China and Soviet Union, eventually what starts to happen in like the 60s and early 70s, they kind of stop clicking well together. And it's almost like they start competing against themselves to see which one is the the more significant, more uh, important, you might say, communist power. And we use that, or specifically our president Nixon uses that to kind of create some kind of a spark between US and China. Like, let's reignite that spark. Let's get us together. There's a really well-publicized ping-pong match between the two countries, and it's held at the World Table Tennis Championship in 1971. And that's kind of what starts this like, all right, well, why don't we get together? Why doesn't the president visit? Why don't we have some relations? Which leads to ultimately trade deals are yeah, struck. Trade, yeah. After this, um, Nixon will visit China, the first um sitting U.S. president to visit China just 10 months after this. And it all yeah. starts because of Glenn Cowan. He was a uh, American ping pong player. They were already playing the World Tennis Championships in um, Japan. And what happened was he was um, missed his bus. So he had to get on a bus with a Chinese player. And then he came, became friends with some of the Chinese players there. And then there were pictures taken. And then what happened was the Chinese government invited the U.S. team to travel to China for an exhibition match. And they played all over. They actually played on the Great Wall of China. And in the Forbidden City, they were playing like ping pong matches all throughout ping China. Pong, and people would come diplomacy. and watch it, like you said. Yeah, and that's what it was. And it's diplomacy. It's kind of like open up the door through sports because it's like a universal language, more or less, I guess you yeah. could argue. Again, that's something you can just do a uh, podcast just on. Just, just on, on that. that. Let's go one that, that's very that's like pure Americana. Go right? for it. Hold on, let me see if I guess this right. Because there's a few. There's I a assume lot. you're going to go with the Miracle on Ice. Not yet. We'll get to that one. Ah, we'll get to that, that one. Wrong. All right. We're right. This, one, this one becomes like a de facto holiday based in the United States, and that's the Super Bowl. Okay. okay. So you have to have the first Super Bowl. This is uh, American football, Peter, not the one that you like when they kick a ball around. <laughs> All right. Remember the, the American football, like the pig skin and stuff like that. And, you know, we can't talk about any list of without mentioning football. What is NFL, right? And the AFL, American Football League. And you had, they would kind of compete against each other. And then they, eventually they, they force a merger. Okay, I know people know about this. It's not like, you know, brand new. But the idea is you have the best AFL team against the best NFL team, whichever can happen. If the Green Bay Packers beat the Kansas City Chiefs 35-10, it really didn't have a lot of drama. It wasn't really that big of a game. Most people didn't even watch it. But it did start tradition that Americans still enjoy to this day because, you know, the Super Bowl has basically become a de facto holiday. People celebrate. They have parties. Um, a lot of people take the next day off of work. Or they don't go to school. I know there's even talks of if they make the season one day longer, then they're going to be able to get that President's Day Monday off, and that you know they'll have Super Bowl or well, Super Bowl someday always be that someday before. So it's become kind of this one premier event. It really doesn't become popular until the third Super Bowl, I believe, right when the Jets win. That's the <laughs> first time that an that AFL team funny. they haven't won since. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, and my uh, uncle still believe it was fixed that uh, <laughs> just to make sure so that they could keep the Super Bowl going. My, my, that's what my uh, uncles used to always say to my other uncles. They're all brothers who was a big uh, Jet fan. So they used to always say Super, the Super Bowl was fixed to uh, make sure the Jets wanted to keep the Super Bowl going. Otherwise, it would have died out. But who knows? 
and that they just said that to uh, upset him and stuff like that. It becomes like, a, like I said, it becomes this major tradition. And think of that time of year without football, or especially without the Super Bowl. Definitely something That's that good. changed at least the United States. Different the world too. It's a multi billion. There's dollar only industry. one sporting event that beats it when it comes to the number of people that watch the Super Bowl. You ready? You ready? World Cup. It's not soccer. the first ever FIFA World Cup happened in 1930. And it was held in Uruguay, and to this day, it is the largest watch sporting event. That's because there was only like there was only like three channels, Peter. <laughs> Dude, people it have, is people the largest have, watch sporting watch event it. in the world. Um, anyway, the first FIFA World Cup held in 1930 in Uruguay. The competition was coordinated by the Federation Internationale de Football Association, aka FIFA. It is the administrative group, right, of, of basically affiliated football. But 13 public groups took interest initially. Seven of them came from South America and four from Europe and two from North America. Uh, Uruguay was the host country and um, it was also the first nation to win the first ever FIFA World Cup. Uh, it won in a final by winning against Argentina 4-2-2. Yeah, it was an awesome achievement. More than 400,000 observers actually went to the matches in 1930. And from that point forward, it blew up around the world. Yes, Super Bowl is huge, but World Cup is a little bigger. Sure. Let's go, please. Let's go to the one you just were mentioning, right? We can't have this list. Might as well get to it now without talking about the Miracle on Ice. Yes. All right. Um, this is before our time, a little bit, but I definitely remember seeing movies about it, documentaries about it. My um, uncle still tells stories about when it happened Running, he almost fell out the window. He was so excited and threw like his hockey stick that he still has out the window. But see, I, I get, I get, it's a big deal. Basically, the United States sent a squad of college players, right, to go up against the Russians, the Soviet Union, and the Soviets. To just to give an idea, they've won every single hockey medal in the Olympics dating back to 1964, heading into the 1980 Olympics. So they were heavily favored the one again. They were definitely the best team in the world at the time. And the Americans were able to upset them in the semifinals. That's what people tend to forget about it, too, is that it wasn't in the finals. It wasn't the gold medal game. It was in the semifinals. There was still another game after this that the Americans had to had to win. They were trailing 3-2 in the final period. They scored two unanswered goals. They wind up winning 4-3. to three. And you have that famous towards the end when there was like, I guess, four or five seconds left when the commentator, um, which, which was in Lake Place in New York, basically said, you know, do you believe in miracles? And it became known as the miracle of ice from there. And in the context too of what was going on in the, in the world, particularly in the United States this time, with like they had we had the um, Iran hostage crisis going on, uh, the Cold War was raging on, and this was really one of the big one of these big like feel good moments, beating the Soviets on on the ice in their own game. Every Olympics they talk about the miracle on ice. I mean, there's no way not to know about it. There was that movie that came out a couple of years ago. And most of the players, only a couple of them actually ever went to the NHL. Like, they were still, like, just college players. But it was a, yeah. it's a huge event. Huge event. Whenever you watch it, famous clip, Do You Believe in Miracles? It was definitely one of those, a feel-good moment that really made the American people feel good in a time when there wasn't much to feel good about, about. the U.S. Yeah. Even when, the, I know, I read about it later on when the hostages in Iran got out. They showed, they showed, like, a video of, like, things that they missed. And that was, like, the last thing they showed highlight. in the video. Hi, the <laughs> highlight was the miracle on ice. And they're like, wow, that's awesome. So... Go into the Rumble in the Jungle. We're getting a little smaller with our events, but uh, you know, well, against we'll jump around. Uh, 1967, Muhammad Ali refused the Vietnam War draft. Again, we did a podcast on this. As a result, he is suspended from boxing. Right, he's sentenced to prison, and then is stripped of all his boxing titles. The conviction is overruled in 1971. If you go back and listen to the podcast, however, it kind of robbed Ali of his prime, you might say. Three years later, he goes up against George Foreman, who is an undefeated world heavyweight champion. The boxing event uh, becomes known as Rumble in the Jungle. Muhammad Ali goes against George Foreman. The bout itself is also sometimes known as Thunder in the Wilderness. It takes place in Zaire. So the idea was that Ken Ali, who's maybe past his prime because he was robbed of this time as a boxer, can he defeat this undefeated challenger? Obviously, he, he does. And just right. us too, George Foreman was, like you said, undefeated, but he was big, he was strong. Like he was known for just like pounding people. Like now that yeah. people think of George Foreman, they think of his grill, like that, you know, the George Foreman lean, lean yeah. cooking machine. But back then he was a lean, mean, like, you know, knockout machine. Then Ali was, you had to use his speed to wear him out, which was what eventually happened. And him winning the championship, Ali winning the title, big deal. I chose his, like, his greatness. 
That's really when he started calling himself the greatest of all time because he's coming back after this lengthy retirement. He had a couple of matches before this, but like to win the, the world championship again, this is when the boxing title, if you were the boxing champion of the world, that was a big deal. Everyone yep. knew who it was. It's it kind of lost some of its luster nowadays, I guess, but it's still cool. Oh, it's still a big honor, but like, can you name the boxing champion right now? Mm, like yeah. everyone knew who it was then. That is true. There's a lot that deal with basketball. And I think when we started talking about doing this podcast, we initially started with the dream team because there's quite a few yes. big events when it comes to basketball. Um, a couple of them, most of them actually deal with uh, Michael Jordan. You have the there 1989 um, iconic shot for the Bulls. So that secures the playoffs, which I think we'll talk about in a second, which kind of really falls into this idea of his shoes, the Air Jordan. So if you see the movie, this it kind of plays a role in that. Then you have the dream team. And then the, you also have Jordan's last shot, right? As oh, a, last shot with the Bulls, yeah. Yeah, so, so let's guess, talk about these separately because these are all big sporting events as far as American is, America is concerned. Chronological order. So I guess you know the shot right, by Michael Jordan. And, um, you know, obviously he's probably the greatest and most um, well-known basketball player. You want to make other uh, analysis, go for it, but you're, you're not going to win. But um, basically what, what this was <laughs> – was it was a shot that he takes against the Cleveland Cavaliers. And it, it's a shot to win game five of the Eastern Conference. I think it was like the Eastern Conference semifinals. But it was the first time the Bulls were winning before this. And they don't win a championship this year and like that. But before they were always getting knocked out. They were getting swept. They were they was just showed his um greatness and his poise. It was the first like time on like a big stage. But it's also, you know, he's winning his Air Jordans. He's 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 this is after he's won the rookie of the year. A couple of years before that, so he's becoming this like icon, and now he's just kind of cementing it in this playoff run. And beating the um, Cavaliers was like this first big thing because they were like one of the bigger um, teams at the time. And you fast forward just a couple of years later, that was eighty nine. You fast forward to ninety two. Right. By this mm -hmm. point, he's already won an NBA title. And then he becomes like the player where they decide if they're going to do this dream team, as it becomes known as, basically allowed NBA players to play in the Olympics. Before this, you had to be college players, non-pros. Um, they, they, they changed that rule. They are now allowed to compete. And that changes pretty much everything. So you have to start recruiting people. And the NBA wanted Michael Jordan. They're like, there's no way we can have a, this team if we can't get Michael Jordan. But at first, Jordan really was not interested because he already won a gold medal when he was in college. He did win a gold mm -hmm. medal for the United States. To get him, they had to agree to his terms. And it's been debated if you watch the documentaries, you do some research. And one of the players that he just said this and him and some and his bull teammate, Scottie Pippen, some of the other players who were in the team, they didn't really like a, another basketball player by the name of Isaiah Thomas. That's one of these who was a great ball player, Hall of Famer, but just didn't like him. And um, kind of just said, if we'll be on the dream team, I'll, I'll be there, but I'm not playing with Isaiah. I'll play with anybody yeah. else. And if you look at this final roster, it is – I remember being a kid and like looking at this and I was like, I knew a little bit about basketball. And like my dad was like telling me, like, oh, this is just the greatest basketball team ever. I'd be like, well, aren't the Russians going to be taller? That's what I was like, worried <laughs> about. you know, that's like, I was like 10 years old. Well, they're taller. Ivan he's Drago, like, he's yeah, so much exactly. bigger than Rocky. Exactly. And my dad's like, no, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So the team consisted of Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, just right there, right? You yeah, have Charles, Charles Barkley, Barkley Carl yeah. Malone, John Stockton, Clyde Drexler, Chris Mullen, Scottie Pippen, Patrick Ewing, David Robertson, and then the one, <laughs> the one lone college player, which was Christian Leitner. All right, who is a great player in his own right. All right, so they get put together. They all have these career highlights, and they go. And when they start, it becomes an international event. Whenever the dream team is playing, and it really ushers in basketball around the world. If you watch the videos, there was never any, the game was never in doubt. They won all six games. Um, the closest game was against the semifinals of Puerto Rico, which was thirty-eight points. That was the closest that any team came crazy, within them. So they dominate. But if you watch the games, like there's like, um, they, there's like a free throws. And they, the one play, the players on the team will like stop and come over to, can I have your autograph? They just go and shake like Charles Barkley or Michael Jordan's hands. Like it really, but it, it made the game of basketball so much popular around the world that a lot of basketball players you have now, all right, particularly the ones from like Europe and things like that, became introduced to the game of basketball because of the 1992 Dream Team. And that kind of just ushered in the expansion of the NBA, but also Michael Jordan. Like this when he becomes a world icon. At this point, after this in uh, the Olympics in 1992, and he just yep. starts like dwarfing everything, and you just show his um, competitiveness. We all know Michael Jordan. He goes back to what we talking about with the shoes before, right? Nike, the Air Jordans. He was so like pr uh, competitive, and so like you know, Nike, Nike, Nike. That Reeboks actually had a um, contract with all the with all the 
Olympic athletes that you had to wear Reebok stuff. And he's like, well, we were going to go medal. We're going to be in a podium. I, they they all had to wear their Reebok, like, you know, basketball warmups. And he's like, I'm not, I don't want to be pictured with a Reebok's logo. Yeah. I'm a Nike guy. And they're like, no, you have to. So he just like, hey, he's like, yeah, you're, we'll see. So after they win the gold medal, he just puts a um, American flag over his shoulder during the national anthem. And he's like, yeah, now what? You're not going to say anything because I'm, you know, I'm draping yeah, the yeah. flag over my shoulder. But it's really, he was doing it to block the Reebok symbol. So it just kind of shows you some of that things. But really, it was like, I dominance if you can never watch any of those games every once in a while they'll show them on tv or just go the highlights of the of the 1992 dream team i mean there's if you wanted to see like a dominance on the world stage there's you're not going to find anything bigger than that and even stemming from that uh i mean it's still still important and significant to this day and and for years after dennis rodman right he's an infamous now nba star often associated with the chicago bulls around the same era as michael jordan because that was like the golden age right of basketball in 2012 dennis rodman right you saw this right it's just, i mean we all remember this just happened like not that long ago uh plays a huge significant role in the release of an american citizen that is detained in north korea he crosses the border into North Korea in 2012 and like hangs out with the Korean leader. Well, um, yeah, Kim Jong Un is a huge um, basketball fan. He always yeah. was. He was a huge Michael Jordan fan, and the rumor yeah. has it he wanted to get Michael Jordan to go play there. And like Jordan, yeah, that's not going to happen, right? But yeah. Jordan's not going to go to Korea. But they get Robin. Robin actually does. Uh, he does get some several other M- former NBA players to go over there, and they play some goodwill games. You know, he gets a lot of slack, too, from it. They're like, you know, why are you hanging out with this dictator, this horrible human being? He's like, listen, the guy, he's just another guy. That's the big also, right? Yeah. <laughs> he does go over there and he, he, you know, he's, I think his heart is in the right place when he's doing these sorts of things. Yeah. Again, it's showing how basketball at least can get you, you know, in the door with diplomacy and sports, how sports can at least open dialogue, if nothing No, else. they said that that's, that was the reason why eventually Donald Trump winds up meeting with the Korean leaders, uh, leader because of the fact that this is facilitated really through diplomatic relations that were improved because of Dennis Rodman. Like I said, including the release of some American citizens that were detained there. So again, it kind of stems from this years before glory of basketball. But also going back to 1992, I'm sure you saw this. There was another interesting, it was called the Other Dream Team. And this was also a cool story, a Cinderella story. After the downfall of the Soviet Union, Lithuania, a small country, winds up regaining its independence. Um, and it does participate in the 1992 Summer Olympics as a sovereign country for the first time. Yeah. Very exciting for them. But the Lithuanian national basketball team couldn't actually afford the expenses of going to the Olympics. So this kind of comes out and, and starts making it rounds in the news. And the Grateful Dead, uh, the American rock band, basically is like impressed and inspired by this. So they step in and they fund the team's trip to the Summer Olympics. And the Lithuanian team becomes known even during the Olympics as the other dream team. And it kind of propels them and really inspires them. And they wind up winning the bronze medal. And it kind of becomes like the symbol of hope, right? Reignited for the country that that spent 50 years under Soviet control. Talking about Koreas and sports uniting and all that good stuff. uh, South Korea and North Korea wind up playing as one team at 2018 Winter Olympics, which is huge yeah. and yeah i think that gets that didn't get as much play as i thought it was and i think do, it like, should have yeah because they're coming together like that was a big deal yep not to mention that they're technically still at war like there's yeah. no yeah. right there's no peace treaty signed between the two there's only a ceasefire so in the 2018 winter olympics north and south korea compete together as one team in ice hockey again they never form an agreement uh, to end the korean war so this is huge uh, they don't really do well, but it's it's a cool story. It kind of shows that sports literally unite nations that are at war, which is which is kind of cool. What else we have? I mean, there's quite a few things here. Well, just some of the small ones that I thought were interesting. Um, remember running a, the mile in gym, Pete? I hated running the mile. What, what was like, your fastest mile? Do you remember? Well, all I can tell you is that I ran the straightaways and then I kind of jogged. I never really did well. The turns? Okay. The turns. Well, I, jogged the turn. I jogged the turns and ran the straightaways. I don't know if you ever heard of the man, um, R- Roger Bannister, but he was the first person to officially break the four-minute mile barrier, running a mile in under four minutes. He first does it in 1954. And it's a big deal because a lot of people said it was a barrier that could not be broken, that if you ran a mile that fast, your heart would actually – like explode that you would die. Yeah, but I feel like I feel like my heart's gonna explode and I'm gonna die just, just by walking just up. Just listening to it. 
Well, okay. <laughs> we might have to get that. Might have to get that checked out. Yeah, I got to go. Uh, <laughs> but he first, he first does that, and what it really did is they set like a lot of this high standard. Now, um, many people have done it since then on the four minute mile, which would be you know I don't know what the fastest mile time is exactly, but I know it's under four minutes. He was the first one to actually do it. If you think about it, that's a minute or actually less than a minute each lap around the track, which is pretty fast. This one I actually remember when Kerry Shrug shrugs off the pain. I don't know if you remember this, Pete, right? 1996 Olympics, um, yeah, yeah. U.S. gymnastics, right? Kerry Shrug hurt her foot, right? The Americans are trying to hold on to the gold medal because the Russians are coming back. And she has to do that vault, very much with a severely damaged ankle. And she hurt her foot on the previous attempt. And despite the injury, she jumps off and nails it. And you can see the pain that she's in. Everybody just gets all over the news that like you see her with her um, – with the coach like picking her up afterwards and stuff like that, um, and you know Americans win the gold medal after that. It's a famous video. I mean, everyone's who's seen it when she does it, and she's she's reenacted it since then. It kind of just made her like a household name, also, especially yeah. during that time period. So I, I, I started doing spoofs on it and stuff like that. Like it just became a, like an American moment of in sports, without a doubt. Uh, if you're talking about a, a sporting moment that actually is not so good and happy and positive, and I'm sure you saw this as well, the blood in the water match um, in October of 1956. So we, we're talking about how sports unites. This is kind of the, the time it doesn't. There's a Hungarian uprising that takes place, kind of like a nationwide revolution against Soviet oppression in Hungary. And it is very quickly stifled by the Soviet tanks, really, the Soviet Union sends the army and military. While the uprising is quickly crushed, thousands of protesters wind up getting killed. And this becomes a big international event. This is like the, the height of the Cold War, 1956. Soviets are using military strength and power to oppress nations that don't want to be communists. Well, in that same year in December, um, Hungary winds up playing a water polo match against the Soviet Union at the Summer Olympics in Australia. Basically, the game, just reading up on this, the game went crazy. And the Hungarians uh, were, first of all, the Hungarians won the gold in 52. So they were kind of bound to win 56 as well. But their main strategy against the Soviets was to basically taunt them as much as possible. So like verbally, physically abuse the Soviet players until the Soviet players lost their control, hopefully retaliated, which would award the Hungarians penalties. That that was basically <laughs> the whole idea. That's and they sad. did. Yeah, they did, though. They basically like just PO'd them the whole time in the water. And it finally got it got physically abusive. I mean, when you look at pictures of this, these players are like bloody on their faces. The, the Russians start hitting the Hungarians. It, it turned terrible. And the Hungarians do wind up winning. They win for nothing the match, and they do go on to win the match against Yugoslavia and still win the, another gold. But the referees, after they called the game, Australian police officers actually have to escort the players back to their locker rooms to avoid like an all-out brawl because they're like, okay, this is this is insane. They were playing a game, but they were physically punching each other um, at the Summer Olympics. So it becomes like an infamous moment between Soviet Union and Hungary. Underdog story too, right? So. Yeah, in a very, sense, absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah, and speaking of underdogs, yeah, a little segue there. Okay, probably Ta-da. one of the biggest underdog stories takes place on February 3rd, 1990, when uh, Buster Douglas knocks out Mike Tyson. Like, yes. Before this, Mike Tyson was just like this unstoppable machine. I think like Mike Tyson's punch out and everything else with that. It was just scary. Like people were like, literally, would you go and fight Mike Tyson? Because, you know, you're just, you're going to get hurt. Like he was, yeah, dude, he looks scary. Like if you watch his scary. videos when he was younger, all those fights, he would just come out. He said he was, he was angry. Like he was mean. He was also extremely talented. This video is now that, that they put out on like Twitter of Mike Tyson training now, and it's like, holy, he's in his fifties and how fast and powerful he is. Imagine when he was like 23, 24, but he was, you know, the youngest world champion ever at that point. Just dominating the boxing world. It's crossing over to pop culture, right? And then he's this Buster Douglas fight was supposed to be like a nothing fight for the most part, this warm up fight. But then he actually, uh, Buster Douglas wins. And then they asked about it. Uh, Buster Douglas says, My mom was telling everyone I was going to beat Mike Tyson. And she actually died of cancer a few days before the, uh, the fight. He didn't want to make his mom a lie. He didn't want her to die a liar. So that's why he knew he had to beat. Tyson. That is, so that's he he knocks Tyson out and he doesn't win another fight after that. He loses his first title fight after that, but he, he, he does go down with being, you know, 10th round KO in Mike Tyson. And then things kind of spiral for Tyson a little bit. Well, not a little bit, but quite for some time, <laughs> quite for some time um, after that. 
the one other one that pops up a lot, uh, which is very significant, and I, I know we for a fact we discussed it when when we did our 1968 podcast, was the Olympic medal ceremony of 1968 Summer Olympics, where you had African American sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos wind up taking a podium on October 16th, 1968, during the Olympic medal ceremony in, in Mexico City. It's a gesture that wind up raising their fist during the American national anthem to showcase black unity and also black power uh, and bring awareness to the plethora of racial black racial people. tension racial, racial tension back home yeah racial yeah. tensions back home they were vilified they're threatened uh, some people celebrate them other people you know sparks an uproar uh, definitely a historical event because it brings awareness to the struggle the African American struggle in 1960s, but it brings this awareness to the biggest stage, biggest televised stage in the world. It, it, there's almost no denying the fact that America in 1960s has a problem and, and racism is rampant and there is a lot that needs to be done. And I think this event therefore transcends sports as the one time where the world started talking about an American civil rights movement. Uh, and I kind of want to finish with this one because I remember this one and, and how emotional this was. And I'm sure you remember it as well. 2001 World Series, President mm -hmm. George W. Bush throwing the first pitch of Game 3. It was the first of the series to be played at Yankee Stadium uh, just weeks after 9-11. 9-11, yeah. I mean, I, I remember this like it was yesterday. Very difficult month, obviously, for New York City and the United States. But Major League Baseball initially canceled all of its games immediately following the attacks of 9-11. But then as the, the country kind of was grappling with the next steps and like what to do, Major League Baseball leadership actually met and they decided to resume play the following Saturday, because they said that the game has certain unifying power for Americans. So they were like, well, like, should we restart? Should we not restart? And they were like, let's do this. Let's restart it. They actually thought like it would be the best medicine for the nation in pain would be to let's watch a baseball game. And the weeks that followed uh, leading up to this pitch, I mean, baseball is so, so, a lot of its iconic moments, really. At Shea Stadium, you had Mike Piazza, right? Hit the walk-off yeah, home, home run. run home run. And yeah, the that was like first the, that was game. That was the first game played back in New York, yeah. Yeah. In Boston, the Red Sox fans started singing New York, New York, as if it was like Sweet Caroline, which, again, never since or before. <laughs> yeah. Um, Right. And for the first time in history, like every fan seemed to cheer for the Yankees as they wound up clinching the American League East and won their place in the World Series. So, you know, I remember watching this live when President Bush. Yeah, well, I mean, what also kind of, um, like you said, they were talking about how they, you know, it's a unifying sport. It's going to like bring some joy, some like normalcy to the country. But also when Bush goes out there, it's still looked at as one of the best like ceremonial first pitches that he throws a strike. Yeah. So whether you like the guy, don't like the guy, whatever, he does, he throws a good pitch. A lot of times you see these like, you know, like normal first pitches. They're pretty bad. Like, well, he's a baseball guy. But he was a baseball guy. He was an owner of the Texas Rangers for all. Yeah. He was, you know, um, so he, yeah, he knows how to throw a, throw a ball. So he was able to actually, he threw a, a strike, you know, a nice strike right down the middle. And it was, it just was like, all right, night game. It just really they say, made people feel good for a night after everything else that was yeah. going on. And just a couple miles down the road, they were still, the rescue efforts were still underway. Like of course. Yeah, this was weeks. Still just, yeah, just, just, what, just four weeks? weeks? I think four weeks. Just, 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 yeah, just four weeks later, if that. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's a lot of ones on here that we didn't get talked to. Maybe we'll talk in a future podcast. Like the Battle of the Sexes is a very interesting. And it, ushered in, it really started to make um, women's tennis also very popular. You want to just finish with that one? Because that one was, that guy was oh, such a like yeah, but, cocky, cocky dude. Well, basically what it was, was yeah, it's September 30th, 1973. It takes place in Astrodome. And uh, Bobby Riggs, who was a self-proclaimed um, chauvinist? Uh, he's, you know, he basically said uh, he could, he was fifty-five. He was retired. He's like, even at this age, I can beat the best women players in the world. And he actually did defeat Margaret Court, which was a um, lesser-known. Yeah, she was she she, she was a, a high-ranking female player at the time. And then Billie Jean King took up the challenge. And uh, basically, if you're leading up to the match, we've showed documentaries on this. Uh, Bobby Riggs is like drinking, he's partying, he's like, I'm not worried about her. And Billie Jean's like playing these competitive tournaments leading up yep. to it. And when they actually played, Billie Jean King actually beats him. She beats him in, in uh, three sets. Yeah. And it was just like it was this watershed moment because it proved that women did belong on the national sports stage. Okay. And like, granted, she was much younger and he was older, whatever you want to call it. So people will like kind of put asterisks by it now somewhat, but you can't, def you can't deny the fact that Billie Jean King won. Okay, she yep. beat him, and even he admitted afterwards, "Yeah, she beat me. All right, that's fine. You know, it, it happens." So, uh, but it just showed that you know women can compete at high levels, and it ushered. In, it really started to make um, women's tennis also very popular. 
in the country. That doesn't really explode later on, but it paved the way for like, you know, 20, 25 years later with, with the uh, Williams sisters. I mean, I guess this is uh, probably a good time to stop. And as we said at the very beginning of the podcast, this did go all over the place. And I think it's... Yeah, we, and we missed a lot. We didn't talk about like Rocky and Drago ending the Cold War. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> that's that's a serious topic. You know, that needs to be a podcast. Um, when Michael Jordan helped Bugs Bunny, like we didn't talk... And when LeBron helped Bugs Bunny, we didn't, we yes. didn't get into those things. We didn't get to that. So... There's a lot, or what the rookie of the year when that little when that kid played for the Cubs. So there's a lot of things we have to get, in, but we missed out on. But you can just let us know about those in the comments. Yes, 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 please, indeed. Nonetheless, uh, it's definitely a good introduction to show you guys that sports do play a pivotal role in world history, and somehow kind of find their way into huge, you know, historical moments, or even cause huge historical moments, or sometimes are the historic pivotal historical moment of a specific era as always thank you so much guys for listening and tuning into our podcast we do appreciate it if you guys need to find us you can find us at www.historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com we are there if you ever need us please feel free to follow us guys on any social media we're all there and don't be afraid to email us with any comments we do like those and appreciate them thank you so much guys and we'll see you guys next week stay safe everybody I hope everyone enjoyed our podcast, and if you would like to email us, you can do so at historyteacherspodcast at gmail.com.